Hey, everybody out there. You've got two very attractive men staring at you on our... <laughs> <laughs> welcome, everybody. I'm Robert Falls, the Artistic Director of Goodman Theater, and welcome to Friday at Five, which is our uh, very new somewhat experimental series uh, in support of all programming Goodman Theater. And it's the way that we can keep uh, in touch with all of you during this terrible, terrible time. But we, we're trying to do our best to uh, provide some entertainment and some illumination. And uh, in the past few weeks, we've been delighted to be able to look back on uh, a number of our productions uh, throughout the past few years, many, many years in some cases, and take a little walk through them. And we're thrilled to have with us the great Nathan Lane, who was the star of Iceman Cometh, played Hickey. And uh, welcome back to the Goodman Theater, Nathan. Thank you, Bob. It's great to see you. I see we both we're both in front of bookcases. You 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 have me beaten with you. You have you, you have a lot of books. I have a lot of books. You're very smart. I'm very well read. Don't you love how everybody stages themselves in front of books and and it's yes. completely yeah. yeah it's really it's, it's a subtle way of saying i wouldn't be caught dead watching tiger king <laughs> i'm i'm reading moby duck moby dick moby, moby, duck. <laughs> moby duck moby duck was the sequel it wasn't quite as successful <laughs> it was so easy to catch the duck but moby dick it was a very small harpoon, right? They just were able to kind of... Teeny, tiny harpoon. <laughs> and they just tossed it across the water and took that duck oh, down. Oh, man. This is something. <laughs> I can't believe I'm doing this on my phone. <laughs> well, you know, we got it together about 30 seconds before we went live, I guess, as they say in the entertainment yeah, business. very exciting. <laughs> but the phone... Like the old days of television. Yeah. <laughs> it is like the old days of television. But, you know, speaking of television... Uh, as as I've learned in announcer land, congratulations on uh, you. You are the king of the segway. <laughs> you're the star of John Logan's uh, City of Angels, Penny Dreadful, which is currently on Showtime. Uh, I just started watching it. I've been binging the three or four episodes thus far, and it's Bless it's oh my god, it's a wonderful show, and it's uh, terrific Thank to you. see you as the grizzled old veteran beating people up. Nazi hunting. Oh, that's, the, that's the best part. <laughs> Having a stunt double. Yeah. <laughs> they have the action figure. I, I, I was, I was. Uh, they took pictures of me and they told me to keep turning around. And I said, "Why?" And they said, "It's for your action figure." <laughs> and I, I, you know, I fell down laughing. And I said, "That's really funny." And they said, "No, it's for your action figure." <laughs> and they were very serious. And so there is an action figure. You know, it's primarily for adults. <laughs> really, adult men living at home in their parents' basement. <laughs> well, you know, you know why you weren't <laughs> looking. They delayed action figure. Well, you know why you weren't looking. We did one for the entire cast of the Iceman Cometh. Oh, really? Oh, G uh, the little Jimmy tomorrow was heartbreaking. Uh, I did. I never looked in the lobby at the merchandise. You know, <laughs> it was right up there in the merch. The Brian Dennehy, the circle the, that went around Larry Slade. It was very moving. Man, home game. The, yeah. <laughs> see, see, you, you make it home and kill your wife, and then make it back to the bar by the end of the game. Yeah. Well, listen again. It's just uh, it's terrific to see you on TV, and John Logan's a, a wonderful writer, and 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 just it's like well, but it's like butter that. coming out of your mouth. It's just oh, like the hard boiled, hard boiled nineteen. 30 E's is really pretty terrific. Oh, yeah. Well, that's all, John Logan. Uh, and, you know, he he sent me an email with this script and said, I wrote this part for you. Uh, oh. I hope you'll do it, which was a wonderful gift out of the blue. And, and uh, I said to him, you're the only one in Hollywood who would have thought of me for this part. And and I said, what, what uh, inspired this? And he said, you know, I saw you in The Iceman Cometh in Chicago. So Eugene O'Neill finally paid off. <laughs> um, so, um, so that's an amazing thing that it, it led to uh, me doing this series and, and, and getting to play this wonderful part. Because I know you know John Logan very well from Chicago Theater. I, I do. I do. It, it, it goes actually way back. Uh, I met him. I met him when he was, I think, 21, and he had written that terrific play, Never the Sinner, about Leopold right. and Loeb, which he really wrote, I think, as his senior thesis piece. 
uh, and it received really? a professional production. He was about 21, and I saw it. And I said, let's work on something. And, and we created a musical, giant musical event uh, called Riverview, which was about an old Coney Island amusement park uh, that he created. And uh, we both got the worst reviews uh, either of us have ever received for anything. The audiences did not go for no it. No good deed goes unpunished. No, no. But we continued to kind of stay in touch through the years, and I've just greatly admired his work. And yeah. I've never, he's the hardest working writer in show business, you know? Oh, God, yes. Oh, yeah. The most prolific. And yeah, he just never stops. He's amazing. That no, way. no. You know, he reminds me, you know, somebody once said about Noel Coward, you know, that what's amazing about Coward, who, who you've worked with, is that it all seemed to be so effortless. You know, there was the tuxedo, there was the tide, but he worked, the sleeves were rolled up. He never stopped working. He was an absolute yeah. workhorse, but he made it look easy. And I've always thought John had that you know, it seemed effortless, you know, but he was writing then for television, yeah. for film, and certainly okay, for theater. Except, you know, he doesn't wear smoking jackets, but he still is as prolific as Coward. Absolutely. Now, speaking of Noel Coward, I think the first time I have to say that, that I sort of... I sort of count myself as a lanologist, uh, you know, it's, well, who knew, who knew that I, I would end up seeing all of these performances, but I, I, I really think the first time that I saw you on stage was in a Noel Coward play, right? Uh, that was my Broadway debut with uh, the great George C. Scott, who was directing and starring in it at Circle in the Square. Uh, yeah, it was... I, I remember vividly auditioning for him and being terrified. He was a, he was an imposing figure, if you'll if you'll recall. I, I had a few of my own uh, encounters with him, and it was truly terrifying. But yeah, but he it was. Uh, I started to audition, and I could hear him laughing. It was uh, and it was so that was thrilling. And it I think it may have been the the easiest job I, I, I've ever gotten. I, I read that first time, and then. Within days, they said, you have the part. I, was, I can remember jumping around the living room uh, at the news and, and uh, to think that I would be working with him and making my Broadway debut. Wow. A great way to do it. And, and, and it was a very, very happy experience. Oh, well, I will t I'll tell you a story. <laughs> I'd love to hear one, Nathan. Oh, I have, I have 8,000 George C. Scott stories. But I do remember after the first read-through, I hope no one will take offense at this. He said, we finished the read through and it was a great company of actors, Christine Lottie and Dana Ivey, Kate Burton, fresh out of Yale drama school and Jim Piddick, a lot of wonderful actors. And he, he sort of announced rather casually, he said, you know what I like about this cast? No fags. <laughs> uh, let me reiterate, this was a play written by Noel Cowan. And, um, and I remember I was sitting next to Dana Ivey, who, who leaned over to me and said, I'm sure he meant that in a nice way. <laughs> so that bonded us the For... rest of our life. Um, did, he ever but, catch, did he ever catch on, or did you just kind of you know, walk in with yeah, footballs under your arm and bottles of bourbon? And... Many years later, we, we did that play together and he was it was a great success and he was um uh i mean he was wonderful in the play and and and, and could be incredibly camp when needed uh which was very funny to see but uh nine years later he asked me to do uh, this paul osborne play on borrowed time and uh which i i didn't want to do uh, it just seemed like this creaky old chestnut that maybe belonged in the past and and why wasn't he doing king lear and i could play the fool and that would be exciting oh that would be exciting but he uh but he wanted to do play this you know, lovable old gramps and he asked me to play the, the the role of mr brink who was sort of the angel of death originally played by uh sir cedric hardwick yeah, I, I remember you're usually up for the same roles, right? Oh, Those are oh always up against each oh, other. and I mean that in the nicest <laughs> way. And, uh, and you know, I remember having to call him and saying, "George, I don't think I, you know, I'm right for this." And, and he, this was played by Sir Cedric Hardwick, and he said, "Well, when I die, I don't want Sir Cedric fucking Hardwick. I want you." <laughs> okay, see you at the first rehearsal. <laughs> He was uh, he was very very kind to me. He obviously he was a, a troubled soul, a tortured soul, 
but he was one of the greatest, greatest actors we've ever had, particularly on the stage. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's that's the thing is I I, uh, I think I might have mentioned this to you that my first time in New York, my 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 father's family were New Yorkers and uh, he he married my mother and we grew up in I grew up in the Midwest and we would go back every couple of years and I got a chance to see him on stage twice in Sly Fox. Oh, great. Uh, oh, my God. And Plaza Suite, the original production of Plaza oh, Suite. Wow. And, oh, my God. And it was, yeah. I, I think the only other time I've, well, I've laughed hard many times, but that one, it was just to see him on that stage. And no one would have ever, if you knew him from his film work, would have thought he was that funny and oh, that sort of balls out hilarious. Very funny. And very and, witty, very witty man. Very, uh, you know, he was very dryly witty. Uh, and, uh, and a cocktail. You know story? In, what what story? About uh, when he he didn't like the audience one night, and he stuffed Maureen's mink coat into a toilet <laughs> backstage and disappeared. He he disappeared. They didn't know what they were going to do, and he disappeared for like ten days. <laughs> oh, ten days, not ten he, minutes. Ten days. No, ten days. He just disappeared. Went on a bender. They couldn't find him. They were really worried. You could never get away with this stuff today. And finally, um, he showed up in the rehearsal room uh, and walked in. And George, and Mike Nichols was there with Maureen. And he said, hi, George. He said, let's pick up where we left off. I believe you were about to enter. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're basically opening the door to a George C. Scott story that he did enjoy his cocktails on, on occasion. Oh, Yes. Yeah. He said to the New York Times when I was doing present laughter with him, he said he was a functioning alcoholic. Well, you know when you can say stuff like that. Yeah, it's pretty much if you go straight to the New York Times and make that. All right. This is the story. My 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 hopefully I'll make it quick. George Scott story, because it was truly amazing was I was in previews with a show on Broadway. And I couldn't watch with the audience there. So I would just sort of circle. I'd walk down like, oh, 45th Street to 9th Avenue, 9th Avenue, back up to 44th Street, and just kind of walk like that for about an hour and a half. And I saw this commotion going on at the theater. He was doing Inherit the Wind with Charles Durning. Uh, when Tony the Randall. Play he did. Was yeah. that the last play he did? Yeah. Uh, I might have... I might have seen that last performance because there was this huge crowd gathered around. And I said, I wonder what's going on. It doesn't, I don't think it's intermission. It's only about 15 minutes, you know, after eight. And I got, and I got there and Mr. Scott, they were taking him out on a gurney oh, and yeah, yeah. loading him into an ambulance. Apparently he'd collapsed on stage and, uh, and I, and the show started and I wandered in and Tony Randall picked up the script and was playing, you know, kind of heroically. Right, right. And I watched for about five minutes and I said, well, I got to continue this sad walk around the area during my previous. And I walked past Barrymore's and George was sitting at a bar stool with a cigarette and a cocktail in his hand. Really? Yes. Are you sure? I am. I swear to God. And I'm like, boy, someone will go a long way to get out of doing a show. But well, is that I not, he, you know, he didn't want to go see doctors. I think it was a, an aortic aneurysm. Um, he, I think that, you know, it, look, he, it all could have been prevented if he, you know, he, he did not take care of himself. But um, and in spite of all of these uh, peccadilloes, yeah. he was, I, I do, you know, I remember he was very kind to me, very paternal and, and, and very uh, uh, encouraging to me. And, I remember when we when I did do the second play with him on Borrowed Time, he he um, Colleen Dewhurst, his ex-wife, had just passed away, oh. and, and he was obviously really really uh, gutted by that, and and had been drinking, and we, he and I were supposed to do a press thing together, and and I just remember him uh, sitting there, and and you know I it was a little worrying that he was, he was a little, uh, he had been drinking, but he wasn't drunk. And then, so we, you know, we chatted a bit and, and, and caught up on our lives. And then I told him how sorry I was to hear about Colleen and, and, uh, and uh, he said, yeah, yeah. And then he said, he lifted his head and he said, um, do you still love it? 
I said, what? And he said, do you still love it? I said, love what? And he said, acting, acting. You're, you, I've never seen anyone who loved to act as much as you do. And I, I was kind of taken aback. It was like, I, uh, I had to think about it for a second. I wasn't sure if I still loved it. But um, I said, yes, yes, George, I do with all my heart. And he said, good, don't ever lose that. It's very moving. I mean, I think that's true. I mean, I think it was such a difficult thing for him. I, the only face-to-face -face meeting I had with him was I wanted him to play Prospero in The Tempest. And I thought he'd be fantastic. And Ted Mann, who was the producer of Circle in the Square, uh, said, you got to meet this kid. He wants to do the show. And uh, I went over. He was doing that play, uh, 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 The Boys of August, where oh, he, was a, a, yeah. he was a young Huck Finn to John Cullum's young top, uh, old, old Huck Finn. Oh, no, old. No, they're old. old Huck and Tom. Yes, I saw that play. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, yeah, and this was at the point of view because I, I, I was so scared to meet him and I was so humbled to meet him because I, I just had worshipped him in everything, film, in the theater. And I said, you know, Mr. Scott, it would really, if you would consider playing uh, Shakespeare, you're one of the great Shakespeare actors of your time. And he's like, ah, I'm not doing this. I'm done. I'm done with Shakespeare. I hate Shakespeare. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Nobody wants to go. It's all terrible. And then he would take a drink and he lit a cigarette and he would look off and he'd go, uh, we are such stuff as dreams are made on. And he would just recite by memory full speeches from that play. And there was just something so sad about this yeah. actor who would have been, you know, you say Lear, he would have made the yeah. greatest Lear in the world. You would have made the greatest fool to sort of be able to see the two of you in that, in that play it would have been amazing. Uh, yeah. No, I know. I mean, I don't know how many people th that's going way, way back. He and Colleen working for Joe Papp in the public theater. And he, he you know, doing a, he did a, a very, very famous and celebrated uh, Shylock uh, famously in the park where he uh, uh, he would have the, the, the speech about talking about his, his daughter. And and then he had her handkerchief and then he would hold it up. And of course, by then, the, usually the, 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 the wind would blow the handkerchief away, you know, it was sort of a famous moment he had. But yeah, he, he was, uh, I mean, he was a brilliant actor on stage. He was just electric. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was, uh, it, it, you know, but these days, people don't know who he was. People they, they don't know who a lot of actors are. Don't know who George C. Scott is. No. Yeah. No, that's. It would be surprising to speak to a, a younger person who would have, uh, might have heard of him. Maybe, maybe if they'd seen Patton, they would know him from that. But even that's a that's a long time ago now. After you, yeah, I mean that was you know was it soon after that? I mean the other performance as we take the walk down short walk down memory lane because again, uh, George C. Scott was quite right. I don't think I've ever seen an actor who's enjoyed acting as much as you. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, for the next, well, why not? You know, <laughs> do you know, so we're here and let me tell you, because this is not Good Morning America, I'm getting constant messages telling me that my mic is too hot. Your so mic is too hot? my mic is too hot. Does that look like a hot mic to you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, my mic is too hot. It sounds like a you're like a rap song. It, a Bob Falls rap song. Yeah, that's what the world has been waiting for. My mic is too hot. I'm going to move it down there. I got too many books. And I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know the the next play that you know you know um, did you meet Terrence McNally during uh, was it Lisbon? Tra I mean, Lisbon Traviata was was the performance that just. And I think I've said this to you, and I've said this to other people, that just blew me away, you know, when I saw that. It was just oh, such right. a, talk about, uh, yeah. yeah, how did you come towards that and that collaboration that, with that Terrence? Was the first, uh, that was the first thing we did together. Um, uh, I, I had met him uh, in the lobby of City Center, uh, the Manhattan Theater Club. Uh, uh, I was doing a play on the main stage that was not going very well. And um, he was doing Frankie and Johnny, the first 
uh, iteration of it with uh, Kathy Bates and, and Murray Abraham in the in the smaller theater. And I was just sitting on the stairs in, at City Center with my head in my hands, a little depressed. And he came up to me and said, hi, I'm, I'm Terrence McNally. Uh, I know you're having a little trouble with the show, but uh, he said, I think you're a wonderful actor and I hope we get to work together someday. And I said, oh, well, me too. And, uh, and then, you know, like it was like a few years later that we, uh, I got called into audition for Lisbon Traviata. They were looking for a, a much older actor for that part and were having trouble casting it for some reason and I went in and read and and uh, it was an immediate you know they said yes um, and uh, that was the beginning of really a, a 30 year collaboration um, and you know he at the time I remember him saying to me uh, after after we had finished uh, Lisbon and he said uh, you know he was going to write this play for me and Tony Heald and Christine Baranski and, and uh, Susie Kurtz uh, but he said he had lost two uh, of his closest friends and collaborators, Bobby Drivers, um, who's an actor and a director and his former partner, and and the, the great Jimmy Coco, uh, who uh, mm. who he had uh, written the play next for, the one-act play that he did with Elaine May. Uh, she wrote a one-act called Adaptation, and it was a, a very successful uh, off-Broadway evening. Um, and... Uh, and he and Jimmy were very, very close. And so he felt, he said to me, he felt that I had been sent to replace them mm. and, and that he wanted to write things for me, which was overwhelming to, to a young actor and, and uh, that someone of his stature would uh, feel that way and, 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 uh, and, then, and then live up to it and actually did write things like well, let's well, together to keep the part oh yeah and and love and and love uh compassion valor love valor, love valor compassion. compassion he wrote that for you as well no no, no. he didn't write that for me no no <laughs> <laughs> whoops no he he didn't i uh uh i do remember being in the first reading of it and playing the british twins and he wrote that part uh for someone else who shall remain nameless. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, he, you know, uh, that didn't work out. Then he was having trouble finding a director for it. And I, at, at the time, I'd, I was uh, uh, I was working with Jerry Zaks. And I, I, and I said, what about Jerry Zaks? You know, send it to him. And, and, uh, and so they did a reading of it that I went to see. And then the guy playing the, that part uh, got stuck in traffic. And they had like 200 people waiting to see the reading that Jerry had directed of Love, Valor, Compassion. And they ran up the aisle to me and said, you at least read it. You read another part, but you, you're familiar with it. Would you read this? Because we can't keep the, this many people waiting any longer. And I said, uh, yeah, sure, it'll help. And so I went down and it, look, that part of Buzz is a great, great yeah. part. And uh, so I went down, we started reading, and I'm killing, <laughs> just killing. <laughs> you know, they had worked for days on this reading. <laughs> and I'm, just, I'm sitting in the audience, and I got up <laughs> and we started reading it. And, uh, you know, it was a wonderful, it was just a, a lot of great actors were in it. And then, um, uh, I, 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 then Jerry decided not to do it. Um, and I had said, would it make any difference if I said, I'll do it? And he said, yes. And then and then he, and then he didn't do it. So then Terrence still had, he, he then thought of a young director. He had, you know, he knew as an actor, but also uh, he had seen a couple of things that he directed. I think Circle Rep uh, named Joe Mantello. And um, so he gave Joe his, his first. Oh, boy. That, oh. There were so many people uh, who have similar stories about Terrence who he would just, he gave so many people their, their first breaks or, or, or collaborated with them or wrote parts for them. You know, he was incredibly uh, kind and, and generous. And, uh, I, I, wish, I wish I had known him uh, better. I mean, we'd met a few times and I had been a huge fan of his work. I directed in college a play of his called Where Has Tommy Flowers Gone? Where's Gone, sure. Which well, he was shocked when I told him that I had actually did that when I was about 19 years old. I thought, well, this Bobby is a Drivers wonderful. Bobby starred in that, yeah. Bobby Drivers starred in that play. And, and, uh, 
and and so he from that moment on he was always he was always uh, he, he was always very very kind to be able to pull that play out of the out, out of the woodwork or something <laughs> but no, but he's, it, uh, yeah yeah he was, uh, a great great man and a, a you know a real groundbreaker in terms of the, the gay experience and and uh but ultimately, you know, all of his plays are about people trying to connect to, you know, people trying to matter, whether it's in in love or in art. And uh, he, um, yeah, I think he was a unique voice in the American theater. And, and again, somebody so prolific, you know, right, right up until the end. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's what I think is among the admirable things. No matter ups and downs and ups and downs and complications, he just kept writing and writing and writing, which I think is yeah. something, again, you know, for, for an actor, for a writer, for a director, that sort of longevity I just think is intensely moving. And to see him well, doing... Well, nobody loved the theater as much as Terrence. Nobody. And he had this sort of childlike um, innocence and excitement about it. Uh, no matter how old he was, he was still, you know, the notion of getting in a rehearsal room and working with people on a new play was the most exciting thing in the world to him. And uh, yeah, he certainly was. Uh, well, a tremendous collaborator, you know, uh, you know, one, a question that just kind of came to mind was, you know, one of the, uh, it might have been the last play you did together. It's only a play, which was also right. a role that was originally written for James Coco, I think, oh, wasn't yeah. Well, it started as a play called Broadway, Broadway that opened out of town uh, with Jimmy Coco and Geraldine Page played the producer. And uh, and I believe Lenny Baker, you remember Lenny Baker? He, uh, he might have played the uh, uh, the uh, the writer. I'm sure, not... sure. But anyway, it got disastrous reviews and it was devastating to Terrence. And um he finally, I, uh, you know, uh, had the courage to kind of rewrite it and, and they eventually and, and he renamed it. It's only a play. And they did it um, first off off Broadway and then off Broadway at Manhattan Theater Club with Jimmy Coco again, where it was a great success. And uh, and yet it never it didn't uh, move to Broadway. I, I forget why. The, the, but um, and then it would be done. It was done. And Terrence always wanted me to play that part. And then it was, and then uh, it was done in L.A. at the Amundsen. Charles Nelson Riley played. <laughs> um, so a lot of a lot of wig business, a lot of toupee business went on uh, in that production. And then uh, finally, he did this rewrite. This he updated it and rewrote it. And I I thought it was hilarious. And he had asked Jack O'Brien to do it. And and so it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was. Were, so were you able, it was hilarious. It was just so of the moment. Were you able to sneak a few, I mean, talk about a collaborative spirit when you work with somebody like Terrence. Uh, were you able to sort of suggest things to him or improvise something? Did he write off of an improvisation? Were you letter perfect? Or in a play I, like I, that? I, I was, I was letter perfect. And oh. only occasionally there's one line, there's one line in, um, and it came just out of what, what he had written. Um, they were all playing charades in Lips Together, Teeth Apart. And and my wife gets the title of something wrong. She's saying it, there's no business like the show business. And it's driving me crazy. And, and everyone says, no, she's right. It's There's no business like the show business. <laughs> we're, we're in Fire Island and we're surrounded by gay men on either side of this house. And, and there you hear music playing next door. And I, I believe I said something like, wait, wait, let's go for the experts. Fellas, <laughs> so, you know, I, like that. I, I think I, what, there was one thing I ad-libbed that he left in, in uh, It's Only a Play, uh, which is something, oh, so Rita Moreno was, I said she was snoring. He had, he, what he had had was she was, she was, I didn't know she was a snorer. And I said, she was snoring like a teamster. <laughs> so it was a little more vivid. You know, it was a little he, bit more vivid. He let, he let me get away with that. But well, really, I, Terrence was incredibly I, witty and he didn't need my help. I oh, yeah. Him. Yeah. But, you know, I think that what, what's what's extraordinary about that story is that he really was able to sort of tailor quite perfectly a sort of sense, you know, of, of many of your strengths, which are considerable comedically, you know, and sort of knowing how to write for your voice, which was which was really pretty terrific. So, well, he was um, 
you know, it was pretty, he was pretty inspiring. And he, uh, honestly, it was, we did, you know, I did sort of hear his music. I, I understood his, um, his, his, his sense of humor and, and, and wit and, and uh, so, yeah, but um, yeah, no, he was, I mean, he was a great collaborator and he, you know, uh, yeah, there was never, but I never felt, oh, I, I the, you know, I never didn't want to improvise, but I, I, I didn't feel the need. You know, he certainly provided uh, everyone with uh, wonderful writing and incredible wit. Great. You no, know, it was a wonderful, wonderful performance. And, you know, you talk about here I am the king of segues once again. You know, it's I, I'd love to move <laughs> king of segues. <laughs> I mean, an actor's job, obviously, is pretty clearly to sort of uh, give life to the voice of a playwright. And Terrence's was so specific. And seeing you do things like the front page, it's such a specific voice or, or, or you know, Mel Brooks. But, you know, obviously, one of the things we wanted to talk about today, and I think we should get started with, is about The Iceman Cometh, where you really brought uh, an incredible, I think, depth and understanding to this a role which I think is is one of the most difficult and the greatest roles in the American theater. And what I think is, along with Long Day's Journey into Night, the greatest American play, uh, I can't choose between the two. So I always have to take that sort of cheat and say, well, it's the two of them. But uh, we have a scene, a, a brief scene uh, from that. And uh, oh, uh, why, don't we, why don't we, well, uh, yeah, uh, oh God. I'm going to look away. Yeah, I think, yeah, I understand why. And I'm going to make sure my microphone is working. So if they'll talk to me oh, while yeah. we're watching, you look away, they'll talk to me about my microphone and everyone oh, else will, will yeah. get to enjoy a highlight of, of okay. the show. Okay. Great. God, you hit the nail on the head, Hickey. This dump is the palace of pipe dreams. Well, well, the old grandstand philosopher speaks. <laughs> you think you're the big exception, eh? Life doesn't mean a damn to you anymore, does it? You're retired from the circus. You're just waiting impatiently for the end. The good old dogs. <laughs> well, I think a lot of you, Larry, you old bastard. I'll try and make an honest man of you, too. What the devil are you hinting at, eh? You don't have to ask me, do you? A wise old guy like you? Just ask yourself. I'll bet you know. He's got your number all right, Larry. That's the stuff, Hickey. So the old faker up. He's got no right to sneak out of everything. Hello? <laughs> A stranger in our midst. I didn't notice you before, brother. My name's Parrot. I'm an old friend of Larry's. Well, what are you staring at? No offense, brother. I was trying to figure. Haven't we met before someplace? No. First time I've ever been east. Now, you're right. I know that's not it. In my game to be a shark at it, you teach yourself never to forget a name or a face. But still, I... I know damn well I recognize something about you. We're members of the same lodge in some way. Pretty beautiful scene. Is it? Was it? I didn't. I, my, the, it was muted, so I didn't hear it. It was a little silent film. So, do you not I, like to? Do you I, not I, like I, to look at yourself? I was on looking at how fat I was. <laughs> how incredibly fat. Yeah, very fat. Very big fat hickey. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was like playing Jake LaMotta. I thought it was a completely De Niro esque. It because it isn't. Oh, I, just gained oh, I thought it was gaining. It was it was gaining weight. You know, O'Neill does describe him as roly poly. Uh, <laughs> I, I lived up to that. Um, yeah, yeah, there there was a there was a Russell Crowe movie I, I watched fairly recently where where he looks yeah. like a he looks like a water buffalo. And, and I, I, I think of him as that beautiful young guy from L.A. Confidential. And I read this whole article saying that it was essential for him to gain 120 pounds for the role. Yeah. Well, yeah. It was essential about five years ago. <laughs> he gained 120 pounds. Um, but I remember yeah. we, we had to significantly probably alter some of the suits from that. But you look terrific. I mean, you know, that's one of the things we talked about is the, the that many people were like, well, you know, they think of, obviously, Jason Robards famously created that role. 
uh, brilliantly, and and that's the sort of uh, well, he, you know, it was actually uh, uh, what's his name? Oh, I can't think of now in the 1946 Broadway production. Who was um, James Barton? Originated the role, but it was it was Robards off Broadway with Jose Quintero directing, who they just uh, changed the whole uh, status of the play. I mean, just. Um, and and it, it it certainly it not only established the play as as a, as a brilliant piece of work, but it, but it started uh, really established Jason Robard's career. Um, but what's striking is that when you read the stage directions, and O'Neill wrote a few of them, he was quite thorough in. Oh yeah, and his descriptions down to what everyone looks like. You know, he was actually describing a fellow who looks uh, rather like you. Uh, let's take the uh, Roly and the Poli out of there. But, but you know, it was kind of remarkable when you read that stage direction. Uh, yeah. I mean, when I first read the play, when I was a kid, and, and I, I was very drawn to the play, which tells you what kind of a child I was. Um, but, you know, I should, I should explain that it all started because um, I was doing a, a musical on Broadway at the time called The Addams Family, which had been reviled by the critics. But um, the audience still wanted to see it. They, they were showing up. And I, I was feeling... Uh, Charles Isherwood, who was still working at the New York Times, wrote a, a very lovely a piece about me, sort of a career assessment, and and it was very flattering and complimentary. And he referred to me as uh, the greatest stage entertainer of the decade, something like that. And and as nice as that was, I couldn't find a dark cloud in any silver lining. I thought, oh, is that what that's what people think of me? I'm I'm uh, I've been an actor for uh, I don't know how long then, forty years, and. They think of me as just an entertainer. And, and I started to think, you know, could I change people's perception uh, of, of me, uh, mm. of who they think I am? And, and, and I also just felt I got to challenge myself and challenge the audience. And I wonder if they would go along for the ride, you know. And you'll never find out unless you do something about it. And, and around the same time, I read an interview in Variety that it was you and Brian talking about your, your longtime collaboration, just as my, mine with Terrence, yeah, yeah. you and Brian, you know, did these tremendous productions in Chicago and many of which went to, to Broadway. Um, and you were discussing perhaps revisiting Iceman, which you had done very successfully in 1990, where Brian played Hickey and he was spectacular in it. And now he would play uh, Larry Slade. And you were discussing who might play Hickey. And I um, and so you someone was mentioned and I was I was like, no, I must put a stop to this. <laughs> this is this is just what the doctor ordered. And I wrote you an email yeah. and said, if you're going to do Iceman, uh, please think about me playing Hickey because this is my sort of concept. And um, and then you uh, got back to me and said, well, we were just talking off the top of our heads. There is no production plan, but if you were interested in doing it, uh, I'd love to sit down and talk about it. And that's eventually how we got yeah, to, yeah. How we to connected. Chicago. Yeah. But... Um, uh, uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, the notion, you know, and it was just a starting point. <laughs> there was, it, you know, there was miles to go before we slept, but the, the, the notion that the audience has this, uh, for the most part, has that feeling about me that this is someone who is here to entertain us and, and he's the life of the party and it will be fun when he arrives and that that's the same dynamic as what's happening on stage with the guys in the bar and Hickey. So I thought, well, that's an interesting thing to play with because we're going to pull the rug out from under the audience as well as the guys in the bar. And then, you know, you have to go from there. Yes. And you have to go to very, very, very dark places in your soul and psyche that um, sometimes you didn't even know were there. But it was a, a good starting point. And it was... And then when we knew we were going to be able to do it and it was scheduled, you know, I knew in advance, 10 months in advance. Um, so 
uh, I not only learned it uh, just to get it in my head because I knew we only had, I know we had six weeks, but um, it's still, it's such yeah. an enormous role. Yeah. And, and for the first time I worked with a coach with, with uh, uh, Larry Moss um, and just to be able to talk to someone about it because uh, just to hear his analysis of the text and just, you know, I was boring my husband with, gee, do you think, why do you think he left at this time of night? You know, and, you know, and he had no interest in discussing <laughs> Hickey's motivation and I couldn't keep annoying him and I needed a professional to talk mm -hmm, to. Mm -hmm. and Larry Moss was incredibly helpful through that, uh, that period of just sort of plotting this out in my head because it's such a, an enormous journey and uh, a mountain to climb. Yeah. So that when I at least would get to Chicago, uh, I, I felt I had, uh, you know, something under my belt and that I would, uh, you know, that I would have those six weeks to really, really work on this with the, with that incredible cast. Yeah. Phenomenal people. group of people. Uh, I mean, it really remains, Chicago actors. Oh, it, it remains York my actors. favorite company. And Stephen Wamet, a brilliant Canadian right. actor and a brilliant right. group of New York actors and Chicago actors. It remains my favorite ensemble I've ever worked with. And, and it's, it's certainly led by Hickey uh, and Larry Slade is one of the great roles in all of O'Neill. Uh, but the rest of those roles are phenomenal and we were just blessed yeah. uh, with this, this phenomenal company. I wanted to ask because it's, it's, you know, it, it's a little unusual, uh, you know, for an actor to arrive with all of the lines. Uh, and I, I think you might do that. You know, I've been working in opera, uh, I won't say a fair amount, but they all arrived. They've worked with their coaches. They've prepared the roles. In some cases, they played those roles many, many times. But they're, and it's an entirely different world of sorts. It looks like theater, but it's not theater. But they, they know what they're doing coming in. And people have said, well, how do you, that must be terrible. That must be terrible. And I'm like, oh, it's fantastic. Because you can start from day one. People know what they're doing, and you can start building from that. And and do you do that with every every play? Do you come in generally with well, the role? There was a, a certain at a certain point, I did. Uh, you know, I was I was certainly an actor in the beginning who uh, just would want to just do it through rehearsal and absorb it, and and not sit down and sort of memorize. And then the older you get, the more you want that foundation. And that it's not, you know, people always say, oh, you'll get stuck in line readings. And no. I, I, don't th I don't think that's true at all. I don't I either. It just, it just gives you a head start on, and, and especially when it's a role the size of Hickey. And, and you know that you have that fourth act aria that goes on for 35 minutes yeah. or something. Yeah. So um, it just to not be worrying, I got to go home now and learn. Uh, 40 pages or something, it was uh, an enormous help. I, I, I believe in that incredibly, and I think that sometimes directors, it's a control, directors can have a controlling streak. There can be a little bit of a control thing in directors, uh, down to that, well, you know, I don't want the actor to have learned the role, you know, they're going to make choices without me, you know, they're going to make choices. And I, everyone, I don't want every, I want everyone on the same page, or, you know, but I, and, you know, and it's not like I go in, that's, uh, I just, I want to make everyone else nervous. I, I don't want me to be nervous. I want to be prepared because literally six weeks for a play uh, of the depth uh, and, and, and size of, uh, of Iceman is nothing. Yeah. And then, you know, I knew essentially that uh, it's a, it's a regional theater and I would have nine performances and then they, they review it on the ninth performance it was something like that I, yeah. as i recall yeah about that nine or and ten that's, that's nothing so and that's the, more that, that's more than james barton had Pro probably yes exactly i think and james that barton was, that was his downfall <laughs> That and drinking between acts, <laughs> but, um, but that's why we don't we don't remember James Barton because he did uh, not have enough previews. That's the whole key there. Bless his heart. He was he was a vaudevillian, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, but um, no, I just felt uh, uh, if that was the case, yeah, it's just the, the nine performances is just like another week of rehearsal. You're just getting your bearings yeah. apart like that. Yeah. And and it's it so it didn't 
you know, I knew I was a target because I, 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 I was coming into that with a lot of baggage. And, and I knew it would be, um, <laughs> you know, a mixed reaction to, to my taking on that part. You know, the, but the, the great thing was, first of all, just working, uh, uh, you know, that production, um, I mean, um, th that set design, I don't think it's ever been done that way before or since with no. four different sets and different perspectives of the the you know the first the small room back room and then seeing it in the second act and uh, seeing the staircase and getting a wider shot really of the mm -hmm. room and mm -hmm. and and the, and the makings of the party and then i recall that in the third act when you saw the whole bar revealed to the front door the audience gasped like they were at a you know um uh, harry potter or something it's like <laughs> seeing the whole bar was was like shocking it, it was like wonderful exciting. yeah and then, the, and then you did the really the thing that terrified me which was the surreal fourth act <laughs> we're, just a sea, we're just gonna have a sea of chairs and they're all staring out and no one will look at you <laughs> and i was like nothing i don't have a piano to crash down on or, or bar, the whole lot <laughs> oh, you used to wander around i mean it was like a 35 it's 35 40 minutes whatever it is <laughs> you're trying to block it it was just like you go around this table this table this table this table this table this table and you were like like where am i what am i doing and why aren't they looking at me why aren't they listening why are they staring I mean, at me so, I mean, it's so painful really is, in a way it, you really have to think of it it's not a monologue it's it is oh. it's He's talking to them. He has to convince them. That's right. That what he that what he did was right, and this is the reason yeah. why it's going to work for you as well. Yeah. You'll see when I tell. Yeah, you. and to have that barrier that just means you just there. No one is responding. They're just drinking, drinking. Yeah. They're they're and dead. Telling me, telling me to shut up from time to time. There was but there was like, one other. It's like, it is like music. It's like oh. you know, symphony. Of voices against me. well that's that's what i learned you know second time around because as you pointed out in 1990 it was an incredible pleasure to work with dennehy in that role i mean that's what's you know again you know it's like dennehy like robards and and i i would hope like you you know it's there are actors who can sort of grow into O'Neill roles. You know, I had the great pleasure with Brian. It's one of the great, and I'll miss him every day of my life to be able to work on all of these O'Neill plays. Right. But to see him play that role, I learned that it was much more of a piece of music the second time around, that it had a symphonic yeah. construction of duets and oh. it, and, and, and the music it's what, it's was... what all those repetitions are about. All about. So, how they change, how at the end of each act, the wording changes just a little bit and it, it changes the meaning of what, 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 what's being revealed. Um, and now, so, there's one more, yeah. one more thing around because, you know, in addition to learning the lines, this is, didn't you also send uh, Theodore uh, Teddy Hickman to see a psychiatrist at some point in your preparation? I, I did. I All right. To, I went to a psychiatrist and I said, let me tell you this story. And I, what would you say? To, would you say this man was a sociopath, a psychopath, or was this an, a crime of passion? And um, and he was he he didn't think he was a sociopath. The, the um, Hickey, uh, the psychiatrist, said to me, "No, I don't think so. I don't think he's a sociopath. I think this is." Uh, he said, uh, "I think he hates her." <laughs> and. I, I said, yeah, well, that's sort of the battle. It, love and hate can reside in the same person for this, for his, for his wife. You know, he loves her uh, as much as he hates her uh, for what she's doing to him. Uh, so, I mean, that's it, it, that concept. Um, it's a, it's the hard one. It's look that part is. <laughs> it's interesting. You know, it's 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 it is an almost impossible task. You know, and 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 uh, you know, Robards brought this sort of malevolence to it. You know, there was a slightly, you know, otherworldly thing with him, even though he was being very jolly. Uh, there was a sort of a menacing quality at times with with Robards, and I uh, and you know, and Danahy, you know, who was, God bless him, was my biggest supporter and mentor 
through that whole unbelievable experience. unbelievable uh you know I'll, I'll always remember him doing that and, and being so generous. no he really was and just to you know we could yeah. we, we could do a whole thing about our friend brian denny maybe someday no, we know. will yeah but he the generosity of him passing that role on to you he was yeah. so filled with love and excitement and he would not want to talk about himself at all he would not want to talk yeah. about the brilliant work he was doing it was he would talk about the wonder being able to sit there and listen to you do this piece. And of course, you know, it's, there is a, you know, one of the great things about these roles, uh, and you've done a few of them, you know, Hickey, and we'll talk about salesmen, I hope, in, in a few minutes, is very few people have had the ability to play these roles uh, on this scale. And it's a really unique club, I think. Yeah, when you look yeah. at a guy and you go, man, you, you poor yeah. bastard played Hickey, you know? I, <laughs> You poor bastard played King Lear. You know, it's like a small group of people get to play this. I, I ran into uh, Denzel Washington at a Tony nominee luncheon thing, and he and he came, and I we we I don't think we we'd never met, and he just came up to me, and he leaned in and he said, "You know what I'm going through," <laughs> and I said. Yes, I do, brother. And I said, I'm, I'm with you 100. percent I do know what you're going through. It's because um, it's it's a, that role is a haunting one. I mean, I found it to be. Was it hard to? Well, I kind of know because I, I tried to give notes afterwards. But it's 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 such a difficult play coming after it. You're you're so drained, and I mean, you do have a you're so exhausted coming coming off of that you know there was yeah. you you brought back one memory and I'll, I'll, I'll see if you remember it because it was the only production i think in the history of the american theater where we were doing everything we could to prevent entrance applause oh right do you remember this well that's the that entrance to me is uh, again you're haunted by what robards did and I just, uh, I, 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 I tortured myself over it, and, and yes, in trying to avoid. Thankfully, we, it, we, it was it, not, we did it. it no, it was not. But it, but it, they could have interrupted. But thank, thankfully, I think they realized not to. And, um, but we, I, what I do remember is because all he says is, "Hello, guys." <laughs> That's right. And then there were these two. Th I remember saying to you, there were these two. Th things that were said one was that uh, john douglas thompson's character joe Mott, john douglas thompson brilliant brilliant, brilliant. Uh, who said he had a dream that hickey walked in with a big roll of money and that, that, that. and then and stephen were mad as harry hope said ah yeah yeah you throw money in the air and then whatever doesn't stick to the ceiling you can keep or something there was something along those lines and those two images were in my head so, which is why I walked in with a big roll of <laughs> bills and then and then threw them in the air and everybody went. Oh, them. oh, it was fantastic. But we forget the few duds before that where you would back in. We would try for a while. Let's just have <laughs> let's just come in ass backwards and like <laughs> pretend that it's not Nathan Lane or anything. That was that didn't work. We tried that for a few weeks. I think up to six weeks. Or probably six. The other one was when you wrote on Sal's back. There was a moment when you jumped on the, that, that was a surprise for me. I'm going to ride in on Rocky's back. Oh, well, he was a big guy. He was I, a big guy. Yeah, but still, that was, uh, yeah. I, I think we found the right thing. It was, uh, and led into the little little song that he sings. And, oh, God, that was agony trying to figure that out. Trying, but it was really the yeah. agony of trying to figure out how not to get applause as to the usual exactly. thing of how do I get exactly. applause on, on, on this. Did you find that doing it, we, we had the great opportunity uh, after the production, uh, and, and I think you know this, it, it, it remains to this day the most successful production at the Goodman Theater that Patti Lapone was not in. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Warped paint. Are well, for a musical, that's because we were yeah. charging premium prices. But uh, right. Pat, that show kind of broke a few records. But but sure. Iceman sure. Cometh was the most successful play and has been. And what's wild was, it was the first time around in 1990 uh, as well. So really? to me, that's what's yeah. amazing is that an. That was very 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 satisfying to walk. I remember at the last couple of weeks of walking into the theater. And there was a sign up that said, don't even 
come in <laughs> and ask because there are no more tickets to the Iceman comic. That, I think that's the happiest sign I have ever seen in my life. Um, so that was very, uh, very satisfying that, that so many people came from all over the world because it's so rarely done. And we were doing the almost oh, five hour version. We did the whole, we did basically the whole thing. We didn't mess around. We separated no. the, the men that's from right. the boys yeah, by, by yeah. doing, the, doing, had you, I read that, what was it about O'Neill or that particular play? I mean, uh, you know, your family is a complicated family, an Irish family, uh, an Irish sure, Catholic I, family. Yeah, a dysfunctional Irish Catholic family. So I, I certainly, my father was an alcoholic, so I had seen that firsthand. And a lot of my mother's relatives were alcoholics. And I myself have had issues with alcohol in, in past years. So, um, uh, yeah, it's a world that I understood. And the, the the darkness, and um, even as a, a young man when I read it, uh, and I just loved the the just the fact that it was uh, all these these voices, all, yeah. the, the different the different worlds. I know. Uh, you know uh, colliding in this. Yeah. Little you, you know, we talked about the music, and people always talk about O'Neill being having a tin ear. You know, wasn't it Mary McCarthy or some of the critic at the time yeah. said he had a tin? You know, uh, Mary was a pill. Um, <laughs> let's face it. You know, you know, an occasionally good writer, but Jesus, she was a pill, and she had it. She had it bad for for Eugene, uh, because uh, yeah, no, look, that that's uh, you know, he's the American Shakespeare. Absolutely. I mean, if you uh, spend as much time, you know, like, on that play, like yourself, you've spent a lot of time with his language, but on that play. That the language, especially Hickey's speeches, oh. uh, are extraordinary pieces of writing, and 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 um, you know, as I've always said, he's it, it, the the thing about him where, where people say, "Oh, it's old fashioned" or "It doesn't hold up," and you and you think, "No, no, no." If you jump off the cliff with him and and go to those places, he's asking you to go and be as brave as he is in the writing. That's when you, you see the material come alive, and it's not, and it doesn't seem uh, if if you're sort of playing it safe and not and not really going for it, then it might. Oh, seem terrible! Different. I mean that that yes, yes, yes. I mean I think that's the entire key, or at least for my whole life. I mean I feel so fortunate to have been able to sort of stand on the shoulders of people like. Jose Quintero, the great, great, great director of O'Neill, who introduced yeah. him to the United States and so many other brilliant directors, to just get in there with a writer who you can't do it. What was it he said about Long Day's Journey and Tonight that, that uh, you know, he, well, we always, this was, he was writing Long Day's Journey and Tonight at the same time he was writing Iceman Cometh. And, well, and and his wife could always tell which one he was writing because he'd be weeping during Long Day's Journey tonight, and he was in hysterics. He thought the funniest play of all time was the Iceman. Well, <laughs> he did. He had such fondness for those people because they were all inspired by real people that he hung out with. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, no one had it. No playwright, no other playwright I can think of has had a career like that where he he had been so wildly successful and experimental yes and, and and then said everything i did was crap this is after he's won a few pulitzers nobel, <laughs> nobel. yeah and and then the last few years of his life writes the really the some of the greatest plays ever long day's journey ice man moon for the misbegotten um huey huey was written in which is a mini masterpiece an absolute yeah. mini masterpiece so i mean no one ever has no ever done that. well it took he him that it, it i always find that off. i always find that fascinating you know that there are writers like uh, tennessee williams and this is arguable very arguable or arthur miller who wrote some of their greatest plays right off the bat you know their earliest possible plays were written with this sort of fire in their belly you know tennessee williams had to tell his story he had to start right off with an autobiographical play arthur miller sort of at the age of 28 30 kind of came in but it took o'neill this incredibly long time to finally peel back and get to the truth yeah. and once he did you know he took you where you have to go and any actor goes which is you 
you have to, it truly is blood, sweat, and tears. I think he dedicated that play to Carlotta, saying, in blood, in sweat, and tears, my darling Carlotta. And unless you yeah. really, really, really do that, it's impossible. It's impossible. Yeah. And without Carlotta, we wouldn't have seen that play so quickly. You know, the whole thing was not to for it to be ever produced or or read until 25 years after. It was yeah. I mean, it's a really interesting moral dilemma, isn't it? It's like uh, she's Eugene O'Neill tells her never let anybody see it, never let anybody read it. Yeah. Well, we're we're better off for letting. I mean, I spend, you know, clearly then for you, you know, sort of going from, you know, the Adams family. We talked the other day about, you know, even, and I don't think we'll go into Simon Gray in this episode about a great British playwright who we both love, who similarly said to you, you know, I mean, we sort of left out a few yeah. moments like that you are America's greatest musical theater star and have been for many, many years. Come on, come on, you've been but pretty good. I, I did I did a few that were successful. You did a few successful, but yeah. And and so I thought this would be a great conversation. You know, that, that Gray similarly said to you, it's sort of now or never if you're going to really, you know, do this. Yeah, well, we did uh, even before Terrence uh, and uh, John Tellinger, who was a big champion of mine. Uh, uh, Simon Gray, the British playwright who wrote famously Butley and Quartermain's Terms, and a play, the play I did was called The Common Pursuit, um, which uh, initially I did at the Long Wharf Theater, and then we did it in Los Angeles at a, a little equity waiver theater, The Matrix, and then eventually it, it wound up off-Broadway very successfully. But we, I can remember I spent a lot of nights in bars with Simon Gray. And um, and this one night after a performance, we were in this bar in New Haven and he said to me, um, uh, as he was, you know, he constantly smoking, smoking away. And he said, you know, Nathan, I think you have a decision to make. You could become a great actor or a great comedian. I think you should become a great actor. And I, I, I was sort of, oh, well, that made me stop for a minute. And so I said, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, but, you know, it's also, let's be fair, it's possible to be both. It really is. And you, well, have, sure. demonst you have demonstrated that. It wasn't like those other, it's like forum, and it's not exactly a walk in the park to do some of those plays. They're different uh, walks in different parts. Yeah. I love, J you love Jason Robarts. was a, a, a hilarious comic actor as well as being the, the leading interpreter of, of O'Neill. Um, well, that's yeah. what we started out this conversation about George Scott, who could do could right. do both of these things. Hilarious. George was great in comedy and, and uh, you know, as I said, electrifying and, and, and drama. And um, uh, yeah, no, but I knew what he meant. Uh, well, it was uh, time to challenge, you know, you have, yeah. there's a lot of stuff going on there. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on there. I mean, I think that, you know, I, I, I share with you, and we've talked about that, a similar Irish Catholic background with alcoholism in the family, a sense that can creep up occasionally of self-doubt, if not self-loathing, uh, a sense of looking at the world in a certain way, which I think informs O'Neill and also informs everything. You know, I mean, I, I want to just go in a little bit more, uh, just, and then we'll, this has been so great, but you know, the other great performance, of course, I think of the past many years for me following was your work as Roy Cohn going into Angels, which was soon after, I think, you know, you, you may have taken a little time off, but but to take on another great, great play of, of, of the canon uh, and, and to succeed brilliantly once again, again, talk about Thank you. darkness, self-loathing, uh, terror. <laughs> There's a little self-loathing, I think, or maybe, or maybe not. Did you have to a little yeah. self? -loathing. Did you? How did you go about? You know, did you did you take Roy to the psychiatrist's uh, office, or did you just sort of talk to people, uh, or did you know him? I, I did talk to people. I, I talked to people who knew him. Uh, I and I wanted to talk to some people who you know. There, there's plenty of people who despised him. Many. <laughs> he was a very despicable person. Yeah, but. I was curious to talk to people who were close to him, who loved him, you know, who would, wouldn't, and some who weren't, you know, were hesitant to admit 
the, how much fun he could be. Uh, that that interested me. Um, but, you know, look, that's another role. It's like it's all there on the page. I mean, the research is great. It's great fun. There was really there, there were there's only there's he wrote a, an autobiography which is hilariously funny because, you know, he starts off immediately talking about uh, um, uh, McCarthy and defend, <laughs> defending McCarthy, you know, and it's yeah, a yeah. lot of, but, but it's sort of interesting because you're sort of hearing it's interpreted through this writer that he hired to write the thing, but you're getting some of his point of view and it, it, it's informative, but the, there's only one book that about him, which is called citizen cone, which, uh, is really helpful in terms of his childhood. And then um, the, the first chapter is, is just about the last two years of his life, which is what, what the play covers. And that to me was really uh, interesting um, about uh, the, especially in Perestroika, about the progression of the disease and the, what things there, they had like hospital charts and talking about how he behaved in the hospital. What a difficult patient he was. Oh, what a shock. And, and um, you know, there's different things that were happening, you know, tremors, which a thing that I used in the play that he had this tremor in his hand because he would, um, and then sometimes it would move to the other hand, but but that he would, when he would be talking to someone, he would stop it from moving. He would hold on to it, and, you know, because he had to control everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just, I wanted to really chart the progression of the disintegration of this vile person and the thing is no matter what it's such a brutal uh, disease you know it's it, it's it's you have you do wind up feeling something for him as as awful a person as he is well that's what i thought was i mean that's extraordinary in tony kushner's writing you know that yeah, he takes yeah. this monster I mean, and you sort of but i also thought that in the work you were doing you know the physical work of the deterioration of the voice and that tremor oh, yeah, was something yeah. i had not seen and i think it added to this pathos well, I remember of tony, withering tony was rather shocked when i i yeah I, the voice because his voice was so important to him you know, he would scream. Uh, you know, he presented one thing in public. If you saw him on a talk show or something, he's very polite. And everyone is Mr. and Mrs. And very, you know, you may not agree with him, but he handles himself well. And he was a he was a brilliant guy. But in, in private, he was a little more vulgar. And yet he's all <laughs> constantly screaming on the phone at people. And so the notion, I thought, by that time when you see him in the hospital, now it's hit him and he's got a tremor and the voice is going. It, the voice has been weakened. And I mm. thought that that may be one of his strongest points. And remember Tony saying, I, you, I don't, yeah. <laughs> he was like, you can't do that. <laughs> I said, do you don't want me to do it? He said, no, I think it's great. But I just, I just never thought about that. And, you know, it was so it, it even surprised to him. And I thought it was a sort of a powerful thing. Oh, it was great. Um, I have to tell you this. I have to tell you the story about uh, Tony Kushner. Uh, he he came up to me. I ran into him, and and he had loved Iceman Cometh. He 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 just adored Iceman Cometh. Was incredibly complimentary, and uh, it was a couple of months later. Uh, I ran into him again, and he says, "You know, I'm I'm we're doing this big. We're going to revive Angels." Uh, and he said, "What is what's Nathan Lane like? What's Nathan Lane like?" And I said, "You don't know him." And he's like, no, no, I, not really. I, and I just assume everybody knows everybody, you know, and I would have think everybody would know everybody. And he's like, well, no, I, I, he, I'm a fan. I, I love his work, but I, I'm a little concerned about Roy Cohn. Do you think Nathan can be mean enough? Do you think there, th could he find, could he be mean? Have you ever seen him be really mean on stage? And, uh, I assured him that I thought as a wonderful actor, you would be able to dig deep into yourself. And be mean. Find some meanness. You know, you know my maybe one of my favorite. I mean, obviously Hickey and Roy Cohn, but one of my favorite experiences on stage was doing was playing Walter Burns in the front page. Oh, great! Who, who may be the meanest of all? <laughs> Talk about heartless. I always thought there's a. a I just loved. I love that play so yeah. much. 
the great Chicago play and one of the great yes, American plays. One of the great Chicago plays. Yeah. And and uh, 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 you know that that it, the the guy that it's based on, um, uh, Walter Burns. The character of Walter Burns is based on this Walter. I used to know his name. Uh, that that Ben Hecht worked for. Mm -hmm. He was uh, an editor, and and he was rather similar to Walter Burns and. Walter, how I want to, I can't think of it now, but he, you know, he had an accident and he fell on this thing and it knocked out his eye. Uh. So he had, had it replaced with a glass eye. And uh, he said, you could always tell which one was the glass eye because it was the warmer one. <laughs> this is how tough this guy was. That's how tough and, this uh, guy was. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> uh, Howie, Walter Howie, it's something like that. Anyway, um, uh, I always remember this piece of business. It's a good, this is a good acting lesson. Maybe to, maybe to end this thing on. Um, uh, there's a moment in the play where Walter uh, is, is saying, well, we'll set the office on fire and we'll, we'll c carry the desk out uh, while the firemen are coming in and no one will notice. And then finally he just says, he says to Hildy, you and I, we'll do it, we'll do it ourselves. And he goes over to the desk and in the stage directions, it said, he tries to move the desk and then and then gives up. And I thought, that's there's something there. And um, and, and then John Slattery was on the phone, you know, talking to somebody. And then I would go over to the desk and I had to say something like, come on, Hildy, come on. And um, I had this thing and I and the desk was huge. And, you know, obviously it's impossible. It's nailed to the floor. And it's, <laughs> it's, Thing for the guy to sneak out when yeah. you know what he's we're not going to open it and show him in the roll top desk. So um, I I would for, for days I would go over and try to you know I thought there's something funny here and I should find it. I'm you know I'm good at this and I I would just <laughs> go to the desk and you know do things that it just nothing nothing would pay off. And then this one night I just said tonight. I'm going to move the desk out of the office. <laughs> and I went for the desk and I started to pull and, and nothing was happening. But but just by a natural thing, my legs started to slowly slide out. So I was holding onto the desk and I was slowly <laughs> stretching out. And, and the, you know, I heard I heard the laughter and I went, oh, this is it. This is the thing. And and it was because I wanted to move that desk. And, uh, you know? And then finally, I slowly... <laughs> somehow, I was all the way... I don't think I could do it now with my back. But I was all... I was all the way stretched out, and then I would just lean my head against the desk, and it would, it would garner applause. Oh it was dear! A very good night. Well, it was a very it was my maybe my favorite piece of physical comedy that I've ever done. Well, it, you, was, it was truly in character. It, well, not only was it truly in character, it's a lesson to all those actors out there. You, you know, the whole thing is have an obstacle when you're acting. There's an obstacle, and you have to get something. You want something, yeah. and there is a counter objective against your objective. Exactly. And it's true. It's, it's, well, that was great. I, this has been so fantastic. I do have to ask you one more thing. I, I'm so thrilled you were able to spend so much time here talking about this work. But My uh, pleasure. I owe uh, you so much, Bob. Oh, well. And the Goodman Theater. And uh, I know you're all going to come back. Uh, Thank you. Ever. Thank and, you. Uh, and I hope people will will continue to support you because you do phenomenal work there. And I, well, I can't thank you enough for how what the 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 opportunity you gave me. It 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 really changed my life as an actor. Thank you, Nathan. And and what thank you. That's very moving to me. It it remains. Right up there is one of the great experiences of my life, and I hope we get a chance to do it. And I really appreciate you spending time here. Uh, I get let's get back to cocktail hour in the Hamptons. Oh, or, or well, cocktail is it five hours of cocktail time by, in the Hamptons? Well, by by Zoom, yes. Well, there, there, there are only there are only virtual cocktail parties these days. At least that's what they're telling me. I probably you know I'm not on that list. You're not on that list. If you're actually if people are actually getting together, but. Uh, 
Well, I thank you again, and we're going to play for the people watching just one little bit more montage uh, to take them back to the wonderful production, and then I'm going to hang around because I have to talk to uh, our audience for just a bit. But I want to thank you uh, again. I love you. It's such a pleasure to work with you, to see you, and all the best to you in this difficult time. And, and thank you for coming and sharing and laughing and, and, and doing this. So thanks so much, Nathan. It's been my great pleasure. Anytime, anytime. Thank you. The great Nathan Lane, everybody. What a wonderful hour and 15 minutes to spend with Nathan. And I just wanted to come back and thank all of you that decided to stay with us on a Friday night for uh, this hour and 15 minutes. And also, um, as Nathan pointed out, it's a difficult time for all of the theaters in the United States. It's certainly a difficult time for the Goodman Theater. Uh, as I think most of you know, we have postponed the remainder of this season, which was supposed to run from uh, March until July, and we're planning on presenting that in October. And we look forward to seeing all of our members, our subscribers, our audiences back in the theater as, as soon as we can all get together. But in the meantime, I do want to ask you all to consider making a gift uh, to the Goodman Theater in the way of what we're calling the intermission campaign, which directly supports the livelihood of everyone at the Goodman Theater in this difficult time. So if you have an interest, uh, I encourage you go to, to go to www.goodmantheater.org and consider making a donation. Um, thanks also to the generosity of our terrific Board of Trustees who are going to be matching anything that anyone is willing to um, send to us uh, at this moment of need. I also want to remind everybody that we are continuing to see our fantastic production of Jocelyn Bio's great, great play, Schoolgirls of the African Mean Girls play, which is going to be continue streaming until, uh, what is it? I've got it written down here. May 31st at GoodmanTheater.org. And we hope you will uh, take a look at that if you haven't seen it. May 31st. So please plan on taking a look at it before May 31st. It's a fantastic production. And I also want to invite you to uh, join us again next week at the Goodman's Live at 5. Uh, I'm also going to be in conversation uh, with uh, one of the great artistic associates, one of our greatest artists, Mary Zimmerman, talking about the uh, remarkable productions that she's created at the Goodman for almost 25 years. She's an extraordinary artist. Uh, we think you're going to enjoy that conversation. We hope to see you at many of these Fridays over the next couple of months. And thank you so much for being with us for a conversation with Nathan Lane.